Hi, this is Turgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. As you know, on occasion, I like to make videos where I offer critiques of the teachings of people who have influenced me a lot in terms of how I see clients. So in this particular episode, I'm going to look at the work of Herbert and David Spiegel, two hypnosis pioneers who have influenced my work a lot and who have had quite a bit of influence on many people throughout the world. I'm going to look at what I perceive to be the strengths and their weaknesses of their claims uh, of their teachings, my experiences with it, my, my client's experiences with it. Um, and um, I, I hope this might inspire and spark some discussion. Now, I came across the work of the Spiegels when I read a book called The Inner Source, Exploring Hypnosis by a journalist called Donald S. Connery in um, February 2003. So this, is, was, this was like five or six years into my NLP hypnosis uh, psychotherapy work. And before then, even though I had read a little bit of Weizenhofer and Ernest Hilgard and these types of folks, I was, I was extremely influenced by the NLP, Bandler, Grinder, uh, Erickson, Milton Erickson as a main influence, and also folks like Dave Ellman. And as a result of that, I, I had gotten hammered into me this notion that anyone can pretty much do any hypnotic phenomena. You know, everyone's equally hypnotizable in quotation marks. Uh, all you have to do is to, to kind of vary your approach or vary your induction. And, and also the notion that, that hypnosis or high hypnotizability, if you will, is always a desirable or good thing. Because if you read a lot of the, especially the NLP literature, but, but a lot of uh, Erickson's work as well, you, 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 you will see that there's an emphasis on if you can get, you know, deep trance, that seems to almost always be a good thing. So I was, I was under this belief. Now, reading The Inner Source by Donald S. Connery, which is one of my favorite hypnosis books, and a little bit later, Trance and Treatment by the Spiegels really helped me. It was like drinking a glass of, of cold water on a hot summer day, or in my case, probably a, a cup of Pepsi Max or, or something like that, since that's kind of my, my, my preference. Um, the first thing that struck me was in their approach was a pragmatism, very much a pragmatism, as as they themselves say, a kind of respectful Im impatience of saying to their clients, look, you have the answers, get going, don't, don't depend on me. And what they would do is that they would use something they call the hypnotic induction profile, um, something I'll talk a little bit about a bit later, developed by Herbert Spiegel, to assess what they thought was the client's hypnotic capacity, whether they scored as a low hypnotizable, medium hypnotizable, or high hypnotizable. And then they would tailor their approach based upon the client's hypnotizability. They, they would teach the person these self-hypnosis strategies, a little induction ritual, and, and, and these strategies to kind of lock in a new perspective. Uh, on something, whether that be stuttering, pain, smoking, fear of flying. And I, I, I just really fell for the pragmatism of it. This um, preference for teaching people how to do it themselves and to kind of get rid of their clients as quickly as possible. I, I, I really like that attitude in, in terms of fostering or encouraging the client's autonomy. They, they, they also did a very good job in emphasizing that this is a capacity that the client has that you can help them tune into and to utilize. This notion of, and I should say that I no longer work or identify myself as a hypnotherapist or an NLP 
practitioner, I teach something called the psychological illusion model, which is more psychoeducational about helping people develop insights into the illusory nature of their experience. But my background in hypnosis deeply influences the artistry in which I guide people. And this whole notion of people being more or less, having more or less hypnotic capacity still influences my work. So, but, but at the time, this notion of adapting how you work with the client to a client's particular hypnotic capacity was brand new to me. And it proved to me to be extremely useful because the, the, the truth is that a, a lot of people can't really do these hypnotic phenomena, right? So in, in, instead of breaking my back, trying to turn everyone into good hypnotic subjects and assuming that everyone could do everything, I, I started reading through the literature and, and, and discovered that, that the, the Spiegels were right. People vary widely in their hypnotic capacity, widely. And if, if you test people at a 25-year interval, the, the results are more stable than those of IQ tests. Now, that doesn't mean that people can't improve somewhat with different frames and, and, and different training, but, but I, I have to honestly say that I've, I've never seen someone go from a truly low hypnotizable to, to a hypnotic virtuoso. I've, I've never seen it. I've dabbled with, with Spanos and Chavez's stuff, you know, the Carleton Skills Training Package. I, I don't really think that those who promote the idea that they're turning low hypnotizables into high hypnotizables, that they're actually doing that. I think they're helping them change how they behave and, and how they interpret things a, a, a little bit. So the, the second thing that was extremely useful for me and which was completely new was that the Spiegels wrote that Working with someone who's highly hypnotizable, who has a lot of hypnotic uh, capacity, uh, brings its own unique challenges that you better be aware of. That high hypnotic talent is a double-edged sword. This was completely new to me. And this is something I've, in my own experience, discovered in working with clients to be the case. Uh, Herbert Spiegel, called this the the grade five syndrome. I'm going to quote here from uh, the Spiegels' book, Trans and Treatment, because I, I think this is extremely well written. So it says, the, the grade five syndrome, special considerations in treating the Dionysian. So they, they, they used the old Greek mythology, Apollo for the low hypnotizable, uh, Odysseus for the medium, and Dionysus for, for the high. I'm probably butchering those, those terms. I don't speak Greek. But, but, but anyways, uh, what they write here is highly hypnotizable individuals who also have psychological problems present special difficulties for the psychotherapist. Um, let's see here. The highly hypnotizable individuals in terms of personality style and characteristics, such as relative proneness to trust, a reliance on feeling rather than reasoning, a tendency to live in the present, and a capacity for intense focus and concentration. Now, here's an important point. When severe psychological decompensation occurs, these normal attributes are exaggerated and the individual becomes the victim of his or her own capacities rather than the master of them. A proneness to trust becomes a pathological compliance with people in his or her environment. A preference for feeling over reason becomes an unwillingness to think through the consequences of action. A tendency to live in the present becomes a denial of past precedents and future consequences. And the capacity for intense concentration becomes transformed into dissociate episodes such as fugue states. These patients, when stressed, often present with hysterical symptoms, conversion reactions, dissociative episodes, or interpersonal difficulties, including classical hysterical sexualizing of the non-sexual 
and desexualizing of the sexual in relationships. So, to, to be very practical, um, <clears throat> as Dabney Ewan, uh, a also kind of well-known um, medical doctor who's a hypnotherapist wrote, uh, it, it's the highly hypnotizables who often make dramatic initial uh, changes who return to the hospital again and again. The results with these folks can very often become easy, easy come, easy go, meaning they're, they're kind of compulsively responding to suggestion. They're, they're, they're not necessarily making any discoveries or learning anything new. So they, they might very willingly get absorbed into a new suggested reality. But as soon as they meet their regular pals or they go to their doctor or they go to some other context where they're given different cues on how to behave or see the world, it might very easily be as if you never actually worked with that person to begin with. So the irony is that it, it can be very tempting to just do hypnosis with these people and give them suggestions and kind of utilize that high hypnotic capacity. But, but very often, you're, you're better served with helping them to facilitate more internal autonomy, more of a sense of choice coming out of hypnosis, so to speak, and using a bit more of, of their reasoning. Uh, the, the, the highly hypnotizable are also way more likely. So before I say that, I'll, I'll give you a, um, an example I work with of, of, of a young man uh, called Richard, who was very highly hypnotizable. And <clears throat> I did a first session with him for his allergies and they went away. And this, then his uncle brought him back and, and, and kind of said, there's no change and this and that. And, and. His mother to me, I spoke to his mother and, and, and the mother seemed extremely dominant and controlling. And she, she would give him these suggestions that people in our family are allergic and Richard, how are your allergies today? And when she asked those questions, he would comply by actually developing the symptoms. So I could look at Richard and, and say, Richard, if your mother was here right now and she asked you, how are your allergies, Richard? Can you feel them coming on today? He would actually produce those sensations, right? So, so I, I had to have a talk. He was a teenager. So, so I had to have a talk with his mother to get her to kind of understand his high hypnotizability and, and, to, to help me out and to support him not being allergic. So highly hypnotizable folks, the, the extremely highly hypnotizable folks, can often be way more sensitive to cues from the environment and uh, the changes might be more dependent upon social support. Um, they, they, they also, these highly hypnotizables, it's really fascinating. They, they, they often have very little curiosity about how these things work. They don't necessarily ask the why questions. It's just more what and action oriented. So, so approaches that try to dig into the reasons for their symptoms or what might be going on often has a tendency to, to lose these folks. They, they don't necessarily operate here. The highly hypnotizables also tend to be more sensitive to developing what you could call somatic metaphors and conversion symptoms. So these, the, the, these, these are kind of weird symptoms where people don't necessarily have any pathology, but they kind of somaticize uh, interpersonal or, or internal conflicts that they have, so that they might have non-epileptic seizures, for example, or, or a weird form of paralysis, or pains or symptoms that seem very symbolic, uh, in a sense. So they, they seem to be overrepresented on conversion 
disorders, somatic metaphors, um, anything to do with 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 dissociating the, the dissociative type type symptoms um, and Spiegel the the Spiegels did something else that was interesting they they, they kind of had this theory about how our personalities um, influenced strongly our hypnotic capacity. And, they, and, and they had this, this little interview that they would do with clients. And I'll, I'll go through it with you right now and, and, and just offer what, what my observations are. So let's see here. So these are the questions. So his, this is the first one. And it, it revolves around absorption. And this, in my opinion, is, is the strongest uh, kind of marker for high hypnotic capacity. This, 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 this ability to get really absorbed into a suggested experience and, and lose the wider context. Some people are really good at this. Some people are not very good at this uh, at all. Now, here's the thing. If someone scores high on absorption or they're really good at absorption, um, there's a good possibility that they will also be a great hypnotic subject, but there's no guarantee. But if someone is not at all good at absorption, it's an extremely slim chance that they will turn out to be a a good hypnotic subject. So, so this is the question. As you concentrate on watching a movie or a play, do you get so absorbed into what is going on that you lose awareness of where you are? If so, do you ever get so absorbed that when the curtain comes down, you're surprised to realize you're sitting in the theater? So the, the, the very highly hypnotizable folks are the ones who will say yes to that final one. Like they, they get so absorbed into the movie or the book or the play that when the curtain comes down, they're, they're, they need some time to kind of re, reorganize and realize that they're actually sitting in the theater. Uh, the, the, the ones who are on the low hypnotic scale will usually, are, are more often people who say, no, I, I don't really get absorbed into movies. Um, I, I, I don't get lost in daydreams. Uh, I, I never cry when I read a book or watch a good movie, or I, I, I don't get really touched, emotionally engaged. Like they're always kind of aware of the periphery of, of, of what's going on. And, and then the medium hypnotizable ones are, are kind of somewhere in between, right? So in my experience, this, this absorption capacity is it's not a guarantee that someone's highly highly hypnotizable, but it, it, it's a it's a it's 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 the best indicator. Uh, the the second one is in general, as you perceive time, do you focus more of your attention upon the past, present, or future, or all three equally? Now, the highly hypnotizable folks have a tendency to very much live in the present. They, they, they prioritize action and experience over philosophy and, and kind of thinking about things. Whereas the low hypnotizables tend to do a lot of planning or, you know, for the future or kind of reflection and rumination about the past. They're, they're, they're more stuck in their head, uh, that sort of stuff. And, and, and then the mediums are kind of in between. I found this one too to be quite reliable, quite reliable, even though this is something that seems very modifiable, meaning I've had tons of clients who have been riddled with internal dialogue and rumination and worry, who have been able to more or less turn that off. So this is something that people can, can um, strongly um, influence with some skill and, and with some training. But it is, in my experience, usually correct that, that the, the, the people who are low on the hypnotic scale, in addition to, to, to not getting that absorbed into movies and daydreams and books and suggested ideas, 
they, they have a tendency to be more lost in thought and planning for the future and reflecting upon the past. And the, the high hyp hypnotizables do less of that. Uh, let's see. Third one, the French philosopher Pascal once said, the heart has a mind which the brain does not understand. He said there are two kinds of mind, the heart mind and the brain mind. As you know yourself, which of these two minds do you give priority to? So the theory here is that the highly hypnotizable ones tend to be more feeling oriented. Uh, the low hypnotizables tend to be more reason oriented. They want to understand, they want to analyze, they want to use their logic. Versus the highly hypnotizables are more feeling oriented. And the mid-range folks are kind of more of a you know, balance blend. I found this to be more accurate than not, even though to me it seems less strong as an indicator than, than the Spiegel's right, even though it seems for the most part to be very accurate with the highly hypnotizable folks. But I have met people who are very feeling oriented, who are not necessarily good hypnotic subjects at all. And I met people who are very analytical, who, um, who have been excellent uh, hypnotic subjects. So one great example of this is uh, the neuroscientist, philosopher, and meditation teacher, Sam Harris, who, if, if you ever read his books or heard his talks, you know, he, he seems very much, uh, his personality seems very much to, to match onto what Spiegel would describe as Apollo, you know, reason, understanding, logic, facts, evidence, uh, but according to Sam, he scores as a very highly hypnotizable on the Stanford scales, which is a different uh, metric than the hip or the hypnotic induction uh, profile. But, but they, they, the results kind of overlap. So, so that is interesting. So in, in, in terms of this, you know, I'll, I'll give you three examples of highly hypnotizable people who you may have heard of if you're into this field. Or let me hold off on that until I've gone through the list. Okay. So, uh, number four, as you relate to another person, do you prefer to control the interaction or do you prefer to let the other person take over if she, he, or she wishes? Now, the theory here, again, is that the highly hypnotizable person is more likely to let other people kind of call the shots and that the low hypnotizables more want to be in charge. And again, I, I would say it's not necessarily that tight of a correlation, but I would say that it's, it, it's, it's more accurate than inaccurate as a generalization. The low hypnotizables tend to be more control freaks uh, who, who want to be in control and who want to be in charge. And, and the highly hypnotizable tend to very often be more comfortable with, with someone else calling the shots. But this also has to do with context, and it has to do with um, your your uh, your developmental stage, you know, psychologically as well. Uh, let's see the the next one, number five. In your proneness or tendency to trust people, uh, where would you place yourself, uh, average, above, or below? A again, the theory is that the, the the highly hypnotizable have a tendency to be more trusting. The low hypnotizables tend to be more cynical or, or less trusting. And then you have the, the, the mid-range. And uh, yeah, more often than not, even though I have found a lot of people who are extremely trusting who are on the low side, and I find people who have been quite cynical who are on the high side. So it, it, it's not a tight uh, correlation. Um, as you're learning something new, do you tend to judge it critically at the time you're learning it, or do you accept it and perhaps judge it critically at a later time? Again, here the high hypnotizables would be more likely to, to, to kind of just go into it with a know-nothing state and absorb it, and then perhaps critically evaluate it later, if at all, versus the low, who's, who, who's more tentative and more analytical and, 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 and more skeptical, in a sense. 
even though a lot of psychological research tends to point in the direction that our brains are belief engines. I highly recommend Michael Shermer's excellent book, The Believing Brain, if you want to read up on this. You know, that we, we kind of start by believing and then we use our reasoning skills and intelligence more like a lawyer or press secretary after the fact to kind of justify and make and find evidence for that which we already believe. So it seems like most of our brains kind of work that way anyways. Um, seven, as you sense your responsibility for what you do, where do you place yourself on a scale of average, above or below? Again, the highs here would be less responsible, the, the lows would be more responsible. I find this one to be kind of dubious. I, I, I've found too many exceptions uh, to this one. And of course, it also has to do with, with, with your general psychological development. Um, Let's see, if you're learning something new and you know in advance that it is of such a nature that you can learn it clearly, safely, and equally well by either seeing it or touching it, which would you prefer, to see it or to touch it? The theory here is that the uh, the high the hypnotizables would like to feel it and really get into it, whereas the, the lows would like to more look at it from a distance, more analytically. Seems to hold up, more or less. And nine, when you come up with a new idea, there are two parts to it. One is to dream it up, and the other is to figure out how to do it. Of these two parts, which gives you a greater sense of fulfillment? Again, this one seems pretty accurate. You can probably guess which of them is the high and which of them is the low. And finally, 10, as you come up with or work out a new idea, is it necessary to write notes, or do you feel your way through without writing? Um, this one's not as strong, in my opinion. I have found quite a few high hypnotizables who, who like to take their notes um, and also lows who don't but again i would say once again that it's it's more accurate than not accurate that it's more likely that the low hypnotizable will want to write notes you know of what you say and the high hypnotizable is more likely to just go along with it and and be willing to have an experience now, when I first read Siegel's work, I, I was so excited because I thought, man, they've really mapped out personality and hypnotizability. And, and then as I did more work, I, 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 I kind of realized that th these correlations are way weaker than I thought. And, and there are way too many counterexamples. So I'll, I'll give you a, uh, as I promised previously, here are three people you may know about if you watch my videos. Richard Bandler, the NLP co-founder, Stephen Gilligan, the psychologist slash uh, hypnotherapist, and the neuroscientist and philosopher Sam Harris. These guys all score as very highly hypnotizable people. But if you look at their personalities, extremely different. Now, I don't really know any of them personally. Sam, I have never met. I've just read his books. Gilligan, I've trained with a few times. Same with Bander. But I don't have a personal relationship to, to any of them. But if, if you look at Bandler's personality, the, the, the kind of reckless, impulsive uh, you know, the types of behaviors... Sure, getting highly absorbed into experiences and you know, that sort of stuff, yes, seems very, very accurate. But as a personality, is, is he much of a follower? Probably not. He seems quite self-sufficient and quite uh, willing to take charge. He seems quite controlling. He seems very direct. He seems very blunt. Uh, and he seems a bit on the paranoid and less trusting side. Uh, he seems kind of psychopathic to, to some extent, you know, just his, his basic personality tendencies, which according to Spiegel, pe people who have psychopathic tendencies to tend to not be hypnotizable and people who, who um, are paranoid, of course, won't really but but Bandler here seems to be a, an, an exception. Uh, if 
if you look at again a guy like Sam Harris and his writings he, he, you see that he very strongly emphasizes reason understanding logic science thinking things through um, he, he, he seems to me more like the type of personality you would find on the low end but he actually scores on the high end so that's something to uh, that's something to consider but I, I really value the Spiegel's writing on the highly hypnotizable person and the kind of challenges that you can meet when you work with them as clients it's well worth reading and having in mind I've, I've found it extremely useful and uh, I haven't really found anyone else who who emphasizes it now there's something else here too uh, he claimed to have come up with something called the IRO which is supposed to be a biological marker for trans talent or hypnotic capacity and this is quite interesting so according to Spiegel your ability to roll your eyes so if someone if, if you instruct someone to look straight forward and you have them look up into their skull and then slowly close their eyelids as they look up and then open them again the the amount of sclera that you can see like if, if someone's eyes tend to roll back into their eyes and you only see whites that's a highly hypnotizable person the, the, the person whose eyes don't really move at all would, 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 would be a low and and Spiegel discovered this one day by by working with a a person who had pseudo uh, epileptic seizures and when she had them her eyes would roll back into her head and and, and he kind of remembered to have seen that with highly hypnotizable people in the past and then the next patient he had was very low on the hypnotic scale did not have an eye roll at all so he started experimenting with people to see what he might find I'm going to find something here from the inner source uh, with Donald Connery uh, again about the eye roll um, okay so the eye roll sign as it is now known in medical literature must be given must be seen as only a very rough indicator of how any given individual will respond when a trans induction is attempted it can this is interesting it can however be taken as a reliable tip-off of hypnotic responsivity among the three quarters of the population who are mentally sound in turn to use Spiegel's word hypnotic capacity implies reasonably good non -psych psychotic mental health so Spiegel is kind of claiming that in the 25 percent or so uh, of the population where there, there seems to be no relationship with the eye roll score and and their hypnotic talent that this is a sign that people are psychologically disturbed so according to Spiegel if someone's if someone has a high eye roll and they're not able to do hypnosis well according to, to Spiegel that's a sign that they're kind of psychologically disturbed and that they can't use the capacity that they have so when, when, when I started to test the eye roll so I, I would do hypnosis with people and afterwards after having done the hypnosis I would test their eye roll to score to, to make sure that I, I, I didn't have a bias before going in and I would notice that there was a correlation but it seemed to be less than Spiegel claimed I, I saw way too many people who had high eye rolls and poor hypnotic capacity and, and also some people who had kind of low eye rolls and, and seemed to do very good so it, it was again one of those scores one of those things where like yeah there's something to this but it seems weaker than the Spiegel's claim but Spiegel has this theory then that 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 if someone can't then that kind of is a tip off that they're too disturbed to 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 concentrate effectively or, or to actually use their capacity which is an interesting theory don't quite know if I agree with it but but let, let's see here um, let's see here well Spiegel's clinical research into the significance of the eye roll yielded something else the revelation that eye roll and trans capacity measurements 
can speak volumes about who we are as personalities. I couldn't believe it as first, Spiegel says. Everything I found went against my training. Like a great many psychiatrists, he had viewed individual personality as more the product of upbringing and circumstances than genetic coding. This book was written in the 80s, by the way, just, just you know that. Uh, but then I came to see that hypnosis is a capacity for attentive, receptive concentration, that it is inherent in a person, and that ha whatever it is in the brain that governs this capacity governs the degree of the eye roll. As a result, I made a 180 degree shift. Today, I believe that the major determination of who we are as people is pretty much decided when the sperm meets the egg. Um, there, there's a really interesting uh, story here too about David, his son, initially being skeptical about the eye roll and then being at some sort of medical conference. And Spiegel testing the eye roll on two people, uh, and one had a really high eye roll and sucked as a hypnotic subject, and the other one had a low one and was really good. So he was exactly wrong on both accounts. But then he asked the person with the low eye roll, have you had eye surgery? And the answer was yes. They, they had, so, so that had taken away the, the ability of the eye roll. And the other one with the high eye roll seemed to be uh, to have a barbiturate addiction, and 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 that prevented her her ability to focus. So something else which is kind of interesting with Spiegel's emphasis on high hypnotizability is he seems to claim that not only with conversion symptoms, but but with more dissociation-based stuff uh, and somatic metaphors. So when, when, when people, for example, um, develop so-called multiple personality disorder, according to Spiegel, these folks tend to be highly hypnotizable. Uh, many of the people who, who uh, end up believing in, in childhood abuse and repressed memories that never occurred, according to Spiegel, would, would more likely be these highly hypnotizable folks, uh, probably in the prison system, you know, people who who falsely confess and actually end up believing their own memories based upon suggestion that that they did it. So it's a a a thing to kind of look out for and be careful with. Although, once again, I would have to say that. The correlations are probably lower than than Spiegel claim. So, so for example, um, uh, Spanos. This is an excellent book too. Multiple identities and false memories, written by Nicholas Spanos. He critiques Spiegel a little bit. He he had a socio-cognitive approach to hypnosis, which was quite different, but. Uh, he, he criticizes hypnotizability as a trait. So those who believe that MPD, multiple personality disorder, is a relatively common will use procedures frequently. Uh, well, uh, this, this stable trait hypothesis cannot account parsimoniously for the very high rates of multiple pr uh, identity enactments seen in some traditional cultures. 47% of women in some villages uh, or, or for the very high rates of, of demonic possession seen in some group possession cases where, for example, all or almost all of the nuns in a particular convent displayed possession simultaneously. The hypothesis also has difficulty with the finding that glossolalics do not uniformly exhibit high hypnotizability. Uh, that in some congregations, glossolalia occurs in all or almost all members, and that people who report contact with UFO aliens do not score particularly high on measures of hypnotizability. So remember that Spiegel would claim that high hypnotizability, the very high, the grade 5 syndrome is like 5% of the population. Maybe 10% can score as high. So when you look at like mass hysterics uh, symptoms or 
you, you look at things like, for example, the, uh, the, the Havana syndrome, the, the workers at the U.S. Embassy in Cuba who started getting all these weird symptoms, and then Americans and other embassies in other countries started getting uh, similar type of symptoms. Um, if you look at these cases of like mass hysterical symptoms, uh, it it would tend to presuppose that there are there are way more people than five percent who who fall prey for this type of stuff. And I've also worked with people who have had very weird symptoms who who do not seem to have good hypnotic capacity. So. Just like as David Spiegel has pointed out, if you look at placebo research with low hypnotizables who are given a placebo for pain, it seems to be equal to the placebo. For high hypnotizables, hypnosis seems to work better. So whatever mechanisms are involved in, in uh, placebo, there seems to be different neurological mechanisms involved in hypnosis. So, so there might be different avenues or different ways of, of, of developing these symptoms, some which may correspond with high hypnotizability and some which may not. I should also say this, when, when Spiegel does the hypnotic induction profile, which are some questions, the eye roll, uh, arm levitation, uh, where you kind of test for uh, that experience of non-volition, the arm is just lifting by itself, right? And uh, post-hypnotic suggestion, and you might test for amnesia and hallucinations. Um, what I have found is that it, it can be useful, sure, but it, it doesn't necessarily tell you that much about how so, how a client will respond respond to emotionally meaningful content in the office, right? So arm limitations and these sorts of stuff, they're kind of meaningless to a lot of people. And it's like in a lab versus someone who comes in to a clinician to work on something and it's emotionally charged. People might be way more responsive. And and also in hypnosis, you're, you're, you're kind of, the reason to do it usually is that you want someone to lock in on an idea or change their perspective or reorganize their experience. But I have also had a lot of people who don't do any hypnotic phenomena at all, but, but, but I can essentially do a lecture with them on chronic pain where they kind of get how that works and it changes their perspective and their pain goes away. Or, or I can do the same thing with a lot of people with smoking and their, their urge to smoke go away. But many of these people are not necessarily highly hypnotizable or, or wouldn't necessarily respond to suggestions of hypnotic phenomena, but they can still, if you deliver a good presentation to them, lock in an idea. Good example of this would be, would be John Sarno's books on chronic pain. So many people who read those books, listen to his lectures, and their pain goes away. And one good example of this would be uh, John Stossel, the well-known cons consumer reporter and libertarian author, who is a low hypnotic subject. He's tested his hypnotic capacity. It's, it's low. But he met Sarno once got instructed about the nature of pain and his you know, decades long chronic pain disappeared. So, and I've, I've had many, many cases uh, like that myself. And of course, David Spiegel is doing some very interesting uh, stuff at Stanford, um, trying to look for the neural correlates of hypnosis, some of which he has claimed to find. And you have the famous believing is seeing uh, experiment where you have high hypnotizable hallucinate color where there's black and white, and you see that their color processing areas in, in both hemispheres light up. And this does not happen with the low hypnotizables when they're asked to imagine. Um, so, so, so it does show that, that high hypnotizability and low hypnotizability is not just role enactment, but it actually looks quite different in the brain. 
So I, I hope this was useful to you, interesting. I'd love to hear your take on the Spiegel's um, approach. Know, by the way, that David Spiegel, the psychiatrist, is not the same David Spiegel, the psychiatrist, who testified in the Amber Heard uh, Johnny Depp case. It's, it's, it's a very different uh, David Spiegel. Anyways, I, I would love to hear uh, what you think. Oh, one more negative thing. Uh, David Spiegel seems to be very adamant that only psychologists and medical doctors should should use hypnosis and it, it, this this is bunk you know he might as get well get off his high horse uh, the, the research shows that licensed psychologists and people who have been through that mill do not get better results with clients than people who do not have that training check out robin dawes house of cards if you want to look into that anyways i recommend the inner source by donald s connery and Transcend Treatment by Herbert Spiegel and David Spiegel. Uh, know that I see clients from all over the world on Skype. If you want to book a session with me, go to provocativehypnosis.com and know that my next online training on the Psychological Illusion Model will be in March. So go to provocativehypnosis.com, seminar page, have a look. Thanks for listening.